at that same time was kind of the rise of social media and golf. I was trying to, to tackle a golf course. It felt like a bear every single day it was in the woods. It was trying to chase me down. And I'm over here trying to prove Joe Schmo wrong that I'm, I'm a good player. And it's just, I think mentally, I, I wasn't ever really prepared. Um, nobody's, I, I've never had anybody tell me that I'd suck. And I think for so long, I didn't know how to cope with that. Um, I think it led to some anxiety that I didn't realize was anxiety at the time. Um, I don't think people really talked too much about anxiety at the time. Like there was no players that were coming up, uh, you know, speaking about mental health. But really, I uh, mentally, I was I was fighting a battle every single day uh, to try to prove to everybody that I was that I was, you know, still a good player. And it just it, it was overwhelming. Yeah. Me too. How was it? Vegas last night. Vegas last night. The 12.58 a.m. flight out of Vegas is a pretty dystopian place to be. His name is Smiley, the least I could do is brush up the pearly whites after like 14 hours in Las Vegas and 12 more in travel. Smiley Kaufman, fascinating story. I mean, high profile rise to the top and then it all disappeared a bit. I want to get into a couple different moments from, from Smiley's career. First what allowed him to get to that point in the first place. I mean, it's not just anyone that goes out and shoots 61 on Sunday to win a PGA Tour event. It's also not just anyone that can bounce back in the way that he did and maintain what seems from the outside to be an incredibly positive outlook on everything. Um, there's gotta be more to the story and there's also gotta be some lessons to learn from the kid. All right, Smiley Kaufman, thanks for being here. Where uh, where are we? Can you orient? Our, uh, yeah, our we're St. Simon's Island, uh, Sea Island for the RSM Classic. I mean, I've seen better weather days here. This actually isn't as bad as it looks. It's just kind of gloomy, and it's what four thirty and five o'clock, and it's already dark. So <laughs> it's just kind of how it goes this time of the year. I want to start with a question that you've probably gotten more than any other question in your life, which is. What's the origin of your name? Smiley Kaufman. Ooh, wow. Such a, Smiley is like, A, it's a perfect descriptor for you, uh, but it's also a pretty unique name. Where does that come from? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Only a few people really know the story behind it. Uh, it really goes all the way back to my cousin, who was my grandmother's uh, cousin. His name was Smiley Gephardt. And the story behind it goes, he was a college football player at Georgia Tech from Meridian, Mississippi. and he was an all-american defensive lineman there and d-line d-line if you want to picture like how big this guy was he was like 190 pounds so this and this obviously college football has changed a little yeah, bit you yeah. kind of need to be 290 to be an all-american d-line but at the time he was you know under 200 and they kind of showed you what type of heart you know, he was i guess the rudy as far as the heart goes is how hard he played but uh, in his mid-20s, he had an accident, severed his spine, and was in a wheelchair the rest of his life. Wow. So he was always in uh, Meridian, Mississippi, and I'm from Birmingham, and so was my granddad, so was my dad, and Baton Rouge is about a six-hour drive from Birmingham, and you go straight through Meridian. So my granddad would always take my dad and stop by Smiley's house um, when they would be going down to LSU football games. So. Uh, my dad was just always inspired by his faith, just inspired by his, his will, his, his attitude, and just uh, knew that his first son, uh, he wanted to name after him. And it's fun, you know, at Sanderson Farms, even back to the first year I played there yeah. in Jackson, so many people knew who Smiley Gephardt was, just the family. So there, even this year when I was working with the microphone, uh, still people would come up to me and said, hey, I knew... I knew your namesake, and I was like, "That's it's just really cool. That's cool. Because uh, it just seems so 
disconnected so many years from now, uh, removed from it, but uh, yeah, so many people have a great appreciation for who Smiley Gephardt was. I know there's a lot of golf in your in your family, um, but when yeah. did you know that you were good? Like, when did you know that you were, and not just good, but really good? Yeah, there is a lot of golf in my family. My, you know, my parents both play golf at LSU. My granddad was the coach at UAB, Coach Graham McDowell. So there was definitely a, an upbringing of, of being in the golf world. And, you know, my first love was a mixture between basketball and golf. Really, I just was so competitive and wanted to win yeah. in everything that I did that I was the kid, in, even in swim team, if I didn't win, I'd be underneath a table crying if I didn't win. That's just how I've always been wired. And swim team? Yeah, yeah, I was on the dive team too. We can, we can roll those highlights if All you right. got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll definitely dial those up. Uh, but when I knew I was gonna be good, I mean, I, for the most part, I did very well uh, on the junior Birmingham, Alabama circuit. I'd pretty much won everything I played in. Uh, until I started getting to the more, the bigger state stuff, the regional stuff, and that's when you start running into, you know, the really the players that you play against. You know, there's there's guys here this week that they've met when they were eight to ten years old, and yeah. uh, like for me, I met Justin Thomas when I was probably ten or eleven years old at a junior tournament. So, yeah, I, I think I knew I was always really good, uh, but at the same time, I knew that there is a different level, even at the junior level, the amateur level, there was always one level that I was just underneath. And um, I always knew I had the talent to compete at that level. I just was kind of in and out of bouncing around of being really good to, to great, which is what you've seen from, you know, the Jordan Spees, the Justin Thomases of the world who dominated every single stage they were at. I always had a temper. Like I could not control it a lot of times. And the temper was all about me wanting to be the best that I could be. And I just, I could not put up with, with not being great. And I think a part of that goes all the way into my professional career when, when things really started going south. It just, you know, when it's, it's really tough on somebody who wants the best and, and works hard and, and wants to win more than anything. It's just, yeah. <laughs> the game is, uh, can be really, really fun, but it also can be very taxing too at the same time. pro athletes in any sport but for sure in golf thinking about okay anyone that's out here was beating the hell out of whoever they played in high school <laughs> like just beating the crap out of everyone and so it's got to inevitably be an adjustment to like get out here and you know maybe you're not the best one out here yeah. but you you started hot <laughs> like you all right I mean you're what your your corn fairy season in 2015 was really good. You had a mm -hmm. handful of top fives. You had a win. You finished, I think, sixth that year. Yeah. Um, were you feeling pretty confident as you graduated to the PGA Tour? Yeah, uh, t very confident. <laughs> and uh, I, I really prided myself on being confident, and I just knew that I had some special abilities when, especially at that time, uh, the confidence and just my ability to really like work a plan. I really knew how I could get around a golf course and I was very consistent about staying committed to whether it was, you know, in the gym, doing stuff with my coach, playing a certain way. I never deviated from the plan and, and over time that built confidence to me and it started at LSU with my coach, uh, Chuck Winstead, and he gave me a lot of confidence just in a belief that if I got it on the green more often than everybody else that I would beat him. And that was kind of the attitude I took. And the first time I got to go up against pros with the, was at the U.S. Open. I uh, got through locals, got through sectionals, and then I got to uh, U.S. Open at Pinehurst, which is where we're going to be going this year. I got to play with so many great pros, and watching them play up close I was like, I'm better than this guy. And yeah. I really believe that. Now, the experience factor was an issue because at that U.S. Open, not only did I play too much, I played Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 18 holes every, every day, day, every single day. <laughs> you played a full tournament. It was 90 degrees out. It, we get there on Thursday, and I can't figure out why I'm so worn out. <laughs> it just, 
<laughs> yeah, I had a lot to learn in the professional yeah. game, but like you said, the, I did get off to a hot start and a lot of belief. Uh, I really, uh, really had a great team around me and they helped, you know, give me a lot of confidence as well. But uh, definitely took advantage of opportunities early. Yeah, and, and did it help or, or, I don't know, like light a fire under you that some of the guys your age were already doing big time things around you? Those guys, Justin and Jordan, or whoever you want to say, Patrick Rogers, those were the guys I was competing against. They were just light years ahead of me as far as just what they were able to do in college until my senior year. And that it was actually not even the fall. I, I played only once or twice in the fall. I remember calling my dad saying, like, I, he was asking, starting about getting questions about getting set up professionally to get, you know, all, you know, whether it's money, all just getting set up and, yeah. and comfortable for when you are going to turn pro. I was like, Dad, I don't know if I'm going to turn pro. I, at the time, you know, I'd, I hadn't seen any, enough to, to invest, you know, time and money that I was going to make it out there. And two months later, I, I, I had all the confidence in the world. I'm making the golf team. Uh, week in, week out. I feel like I'm the best player on our team at the time. I'm shooting the best scores. And then we get uh, all the way to SECs, which was here. And I finished second at SECs. And that was the moment I'm like, OK, there's, there's a little bit more to this. And then end up qualifying for the US Open soon after. Um, but yeah, that, that's that, all around that time is when I was like, wait, I, maybe I can beat Justin or Jordan or yeah. those guys at the time. but. Uh, I mean, I think that was probably close to the year that Jordan had won, you know, how many times? Well, 2014 or 15 is... Yeah, when he really went off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, that wasn't even on my radar. I, you know, I'm still squeezing out a Subway meal for lunch and, you know, at, at LSU, so... Yeah. Uh, it's funny, though, with perspective, though, right? Like, at the time, you probably felt like you were so old, but then now, looking back, you're, what, you're like, 24. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah all, all the time in the Very world. young. Very, very young. And... It's crazy just looking back at those two guys that I keep bringing them up because, uh, you know, I remember watching Jordan play at, it was Tiger's event, but it would have been at like Sherwood, you know, like that's, yeah. that's, it w I was so far removed from those guys that they were in a different atmosphere. I remember the first time I had seen them was probably my rookie year. And it just seemed like I hadn't seen them in 20 years. <laughs> and they, I'm like, I've been seeing you guys on TV. You've been yeah, doing pretty yeah. good. <laughs> what do you remember about the week of your win? Ooh. Um, so that would have been, uh, I can't remember what month it was. It was either October or October. November. Yeah, I was just looking at it. You won on my birthday, October uh, 25th. Yeah, I knew it was a good day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> October 25th, 2015, that would have been, right? Yeah. No, I, I was, uh, it was the second event of that fall season, so it was, it was a little earlier in the calendar. And we had a great week at Napa the week before, I finished 10th. So immediately I felt like I was in a great spot for the spring because I felt like I was going to be at the top of the shuffle. Mm. So I, I wasn't as worried because so many rookies get to the fall season and as soon as they start missing cuts, they start dropping down the shuffle. And it's this year's been a little different, but it used to be a lot harder to get into events. Yeah, as and that rookies. could be it. Once yeah. You, once you fall down, then Shoot, you're out. Shoot, rookies used to play. I mean, there would be times that you might not only get into 15 events. I, I feel like it's been way higher than that lately. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, get off to a great start. So I, I, I don't feel like I'm playing with house money, but I feel comfortable enough that I can go play my game and no, I'm not worrying about getting into Sony or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that week in particular, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I, the Friday uh, round, maybe it was even Thursday afternoon, we're finishing up late. And it was just like this and like real kind of dusk. And I was chipping on the 16th hole and chunked the chip. And here comes the fiery SK coming. Yeah. Like I was mad, I'm stomping, I'm cussing. And my, my grandparents and, and my girlfriend at the time, now wife, were the only people out watching me. And, and my grandmother, uh, I think it was the next day, came up to me and, and said, you're gonna, you gotta start acting better. And she doesn't, she wouldn't ever, and she's yeah. died since, but she would never, really ever say anything to me like that unless 
she felt like it needed to be said. Oh my God, so you so, must have sat up straight after that. Her, her words when she did speak, they carried a lot of weight. Yeah. So I think, I don't know if that changed my, my thinking the rest of the week. And you know, it's not like I was really in contention the entire week. I, I was just kind of going through the motions, shooting you know, even par to a couple under every day. I think I'd maybe shot 67 one day. And we get to Sunday, and I think I'm like 25th or 6th. I'm playing with uh, Fabian Gomez, and we're, shoot, there's probably eight to nine groups behind us. <laughs> so uh, maybe even more than that. Yeah. I think we were playing threesomes, though. So it, uh, that maybe was twosome. So <laughs> there was a lot of guys behind us. And I absolutely striped it. Absolutely striped it. I was only one under through seven holes, where I felt like I could have been six or seven under through those holes. And we get to the ninth hole, and I asked my caddy, I said, we were kind of looking at the board, that ninth hole is a par five, we're waiting on the green to clear. I was like, who do you think's gonna win back there? You know, who do you think's gonna win? I think of Jimmy Walker and Kevin Na, we're in that final group. Yeah. And he said, I, I think we still have something to say about this tournament. And I was like, I'll have what you're having. <laughs> you know, like, like that, winning wasn't even on my radar by any means. And, and then I think the next 11 holes, I was like nine or nine under or something. Yeah. The next 11 holes, that sounds about right. 61. Yeah, yeah, 61. Uh, kind of blacked out a little bit. <laughs> and did you, did you have a sense, do you think, during that back nine of like, geez, if I keep just making putts and maybe I do have something to say about this? Yeah, eagled 15, get to 16, and get in the fairway there on the second shot, that par five, and the camera showed up. And I was like, and I think most people at that time, if you were a rookie, when the camera showed up and, and you're like, wait, am I have a chance to win this thing? Yeah. For me, when the camera showed up, I said, all right, lights are on, let's go. Like this is, you're built for this. And hit a great shot in there, made birdie, uh, had a good look on the next hole and then uh, made a nice putt on 18. So uh, I've, I've always felt like when I'm in contention, I can close it out. That, that was never something I really struggled with. Um, I had a couple, couple opportunities on tour uh, in final groups, one being at the BMW in Boston where a hurricane came through mm -hmm. uh, on Sunday. Yeah. It kind of screwed, screwed everything up. I was playing too well. Uh, they caught, really cost me a chance to make it to East Lake that year. Um, and then the Masters obviously is an obvious one, but that was just a, a crazy day. <laughs> yeah. What, but what did that win do to you and for you? Like, I guess, first of all, was it as rewarding as maybe you expected a PGA Tour win would be in real time? <laughs> it's, I don't know, because the week before, Emiliano won. Yeah. And he was a rookie on the tour at the time. And I remember telling Emiliano in the, in the, in the locker room that week, it's like, dude, you won Who Wants to Be a Millionaire last week? And so when I won, it was just like, oh, you know, this is great. And I'll, I've never <laughs> been a person to check my bank account. And if I did, it was just to make sure I had enough money to to, to get by. Yeah. So I've, I've never been somebody to be infatuated by, by dollars. So, you know, for me, it, it, it didn't necessarily change me because I, I was still living at home for, yeah. let's see, that was in October. I was still living at home until May of the following year. Yeah. How about in the way you thought about yourself, like your, your perception of yourself as a golfer, did that change expectations at all? No, it just made me more confident, I yeah. think. You know, expect, expectations are uh, definitely, I think, a product of, of kind of where your confidence is. And I was, I was confident. And there was no doubt about that I, I really felt like it, my expectations were that I could win. Not only once, I felt like I could win multiple times. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I mean, I, that's just telling you where I felt like how good I thought I was um, at the time. And then, all right. Not to take you through what was probably a pretty unpleasant day, but well, first a really pleasant day. Saturday at the Masters that year, you <laughs> shot the low round of the day, really hard conditions. I think you shot uh, three under, yeah, sixty-nine. Got some crystal. Low round, <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, and you played your way into the final group. Like, did that moment feel as crazy as we would think from the outside, or like you said, you were just riding this? confident high so it was just like no this is just what I do it really the whole week was just uh it was a dream and I, I think I tell people all the time if you're gonna play the Masters once you might as well have the full experience <laughs> and well, let me tell you I had the full freaking experience yeah. it started 
Uh, it started in really on, on Wednesday at the par three deal, probably one of the more electric Wednesday par three days of all time. Hole in ones were happening everywhere. Zach Johnson and I made back to back hole in ones. It was the same day JT, uh, oh, that's right. It was the same day JT and Ricky made a hole in one. In the group in front of us, I believe uh, it was Tom Watson, Jack Nicholas, and uh, maybe Gary Player, and, and one of them made a hole in one too. It was just electric. So I made a hole in one on eight. Zach made one on seven. So I'm just like, this is sweet. I mean, this place is unreal. Uh, but the weather that week, God, it was so windy, yeah. and which played into my hands. In Augusta National, if I could pick a golf course that would that I could design to say this is this suits your game the best, yeah. it would be Augusta National. I love fast greens. I love slopey greens. I love playing with imagination. I grew up on a golf course that had a lot of slope, uh, so I'm not, you know, I never had flat wise. In Augusta National, I had you have every single lie in the book, yeah, and very similar climate to what I grew up to in Birmingham. So I felt comfortable and I knew I had a game plan going into the week and really executed my game plan great Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday uh, was, you know, I think I shot, I was right around one over when I made the cut and was probably middle, like right around 25th, 30th, and then just completely jumped up the board with that 69 on, on Saturday. And uh, it was a long time between that that night until the next day. It's a late tea time on Sunday. It's <laughs> yes. so you got a long time to kind of think about it. I imagine, I imagine you'd never felt anything quite like that before a tournament round. Yeah, well, it just takes a while to get to three o'clock. Yeah. I think is when it, when the tea time was, and you know, I I was pretty bored that day to be honest. I was looking for anything to do. I turned on the golf channel, and for whatever reason, they were they had tin cup on. And I'm, I'm just kind of a sucker for like certain movies. If it's on, I have to watch it. Yeah. And Tin Cup was one of them. I wish somebody would take them the remote and turn the channel because Tin Cup is what you should not be watching no. on Sunday <laughs> when, if you're trying to go win the Masters. So I'm dealing, uh, obviously, watching that. So that wasn't helpful. But uh, get out there and, and it's the first time on the range that I've ever had any wrist discomfort. So I get on the range and I start feeling something in my wrist. And I, I go, my trainer there is Colby Toulier, who at the time, yeah. it was, you know, it was just him and I, and he worked with John Peterson and Andrew Loop, who is kind of the LSU guys. Now he works with, you know, you name him. Every, he works half with the them. tour, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I go over to him, and, and it's like Colby, my wrists and stuff, and he, and he kind of does this little wackadoodle, just like, you know, just, all right, you're good. It's like, all right, we're good. And we get back out there, and the wrist didn't really, it didn't bother me the rest of the day. Um, but it did, that was something that turned out to be something for me as my career went on. It turned out, to, it, it started on Sunday at Augusta, it just was kind of wild, but the day in general, um, I tell, you know, when people ask me about that day, and, and I tell them that I was, I wasn't that nervous, I was comfortable. I yeah. really, I learned some things that I would have been able to use the, for the next time, I just had some really terrible breaks and that's Augusta National like when you're like a foot off it it, it can really mess you up and, and get in some really terrible spots I yeah. I really felt like I hit it well and I've always been a great putter and I just really struggled with my start lines that day it wasn't necessarily nerves it just just didn't see the ball go in the hole and wasn't able to make the proper adjustments and the greens when I tell you they looked purple over like that it switched overnight yeah. and they turned purple and I just never really got comfortable with the speed of the greens but the moment itself I felt great but I've never played against Jordan Spieth in a final pairing or against him but dude he was I mean he was the Tiger Woods rock star like everybody wanted him to win yeah and he hit it terrible on the front nine and I was hitting it well and he beat me by like five shots and the, the problem I was dealing with was he was making putts, everybody's moving, and I just could not settle down. Yeah. Like it just was, I was off of my routine from, from him making really just big putts and I wasn't able to take that extra deep breath, I think that day. And I guess to your point, it's like at Augusta, you just need to be that little fraction off to turn a, yeah the low round in the field into something else. Yeah, I, it really was, I mean, because like Jordan bogey 10 and 11, I had a great seven iron into 10. I three putt from like 15 feet. I made, we both made some pretty 
sloppy bogeys on 11, but get to 12 and and nobody knows this. I hit one of my best shots of the week. I hit this high cut nine iron to about 10 feet left of it and made a birdie putt. And Jordan still gives me crap about fist pumping that putt in. I just, I hadn't seen a ball go in the yeah. hole. And I was like, let's go. And so well, I'm he was making like seven, wasn't he? At the oh time? yeah, so. yeah, no, so I'm right there watching it all. But I, I was happy to see my ball end up in the bottom of the hole. Man, um, what effect did that have? that round I mean that that's got to be a hard one to shake off like you seem like a guy that rebounds from stuff pretty well but I mean that had to stick with you in some way you know uh it it didn't really bother me really uh, looking back I just I was just frustrated that I couldn't turn that 81 into a 76 which is all I needed to get into the next year yeah and that that's really where my frustration lies is that I I made I was this far off from getting it really close to the hole on 16 make double bogey from the front bunker, and then easy up and down on 17, uh, where I could have made uh, an easy par, and then 18, I hit a bad tee shot, make bogey. So I finished double bogey bogey. So right there, I mean, that's, that's four over par on the last three holes. So we could have at least gotten it back to five over there, and then, God, there was a million shots before that that I could have saved that could have at least got me into Augusta in the next year. But from a mental standpoint, I, I thought I had learned so much that it would, that I was going to be able to use those experiences for the next time that I was like, dude, I got my first masters. I made it to the final group. Yeah. Nothing went my way today. I was able to feel like flush it and uh, be able to, you know, get it the next time. But that's when all the risk stuff really started to flare up right after that. Yeah. So when you think about that time in your career and, you know, breaking into the top 50 in the world, getting into all these special places, becoming a PGA tour winner, were there relationships that you leaned on, to, to get you there? Or maybe you didn't even know you were leaning on them, but they supported you in a way that, that helped you get there? Yeah, like I said earlier, I had a great team around me and uh, just people that really could hold me accountable. Uh, I think so often in, in, the, in this game of golf, you need people that are great teachers around you, but you need people that can communicate with you and know when, when to push your buttons, when to really step off the gas and, and when to like really dig in and work on something. And so I really had some great mentors with that from my team, uh, but I also had other PGA Tour players as well that pushed me as well, just from the LSU side, like Andrew Loop and John Peterson were big mentors of mine, but Graham McDowell uh, played for my granddad at UAB. He was a guy that I would try to play practice rounds with, pick his brain, and so many things that I do on the golf course are things I learned from Graham McDowell. So, uh, plenty of mentors. Keegan Bradley was always great to me uh, as well. But yeah, really just uh, so many people poured time and, and effort into my life, especially during those, during those years. And uh, definitely forever grateful because I feel like I was able to take advantage of some opportunities. Here we have Smiley Coffin. Kurt Byram here calling the, call the shot. Good, good. Here we are for scorecard update. Jason Tillman is up 100. Cox down 60, Ricky Fowler down 60, Carter Kaufman up 20. I don't know exactly how to categorize like the next few years, but they weren't as good that's on nice. the golf course. <laughs> you can put that, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, do you attribute a lot of that back to the wrist injury and how you how you dealt with it or, or didn't deal with it? Yeah, no, I think if you asked uh, my swing coach at the time, Tony Ruggiero, he would tell you that because really it was ball striking they got started getting me yeah. off and he would say that the wrist stuff really led me down some paths that um, I was trying to find some stuff that really it was more my wrist that was preventing me to um, to be able to kind of do the things that we were trying to do in the golf swing uh, so that led me to eventually starting to eventually leave Tony to go see if I could find something else to figure out um, what I was, what I couldn't figure out with Tony, which there was nothing that like we, there wasn't any special sauce anywhere really. Cause I figured to figure that out years later, um, that, you know, I probably went to six or eight teachers, got incredible advice from so many of them. Like I, my golf swing today. Now I, I don't, I don't see anybody anymore. I, I went to too many teachers, got too many lessons where I finally realized like, you know what, I, I'm good enough as I am. Um, and now all of, I've gotten so many lessons from each coach that all, 
I'll kind of bounce off who I want to like use today in my head. Like, so I'm gonna go play <laughs> with you today. I'm like, yeah. you know what? I'm gonna go over the stuff I learned from, from Scotty Hamilton. Him and I, me and Scotty Ham. I got. I remember everything we worked on, um, and I would say that the physical uh, injuries that I had led to a lot of the mental hurdles that I was eventually having to deal yeah. with. And at that same time was kind of the rise of social media and golf. You know, I just come up, you know, there were plenty of players that had so many more followers in the PGA Tour. Like, the, like there were, I feel like the players were more popular than like the PGA Tour socials at yeah, the time. Yeah, it just, sure, like it's, Poulter and it's Stuart Singh. Exactly, it's changed, it's changed, it's changed. Yeah. It's changed. And uh, I, I saw the best and worst of it in such a snapshot of, of a couple of years. And, you know, I kind of came, like everybody figured out who I was whether it was from winning in Las Vegas, with, whether it was Augusta, or two weeks later with uh, the boys down at the Bahamas. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where people know me from at the time. And, and then those last, the two or three years after that, I, I think people always thought I compared my game to those three players mm -hmm. and was trying to chase those guys down and, and be at those guys' level. And I did, when I was playing well, I did, I did feel like I was at their level. But when I started getting injured and I wasn't playing as well, I wasn't even close to their level. So I was just trying, not only was I trying to, to play better, I was trying to, to tackle a golf course. It felt like a bear every single day it was in the woods. It was trying to chase me down. And I'm over here trying to prove Joe Schmo wrong that I'm, I'm a good player. And it's just, I think mentally I, I wasn't ever really prepared um nobody's I, i've never had anybody tell me that i'd suck and i think for so long i didn't know how to cope with that um yeah. i think it led to some anxiety that i didn't realize was anxiety at the time um i don't think people really talked too much about anxiety at the time like there was no players yeah. that were coming up uh you know speaking about mental health but really i uh mentally i was i was fighting a battle every single day uh, to try to prove to everybody that I was, that I was, you know, still a good player. And it just, it was overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, I promise this is the only time that I'll compare my golf game to yours, but you know, I've played many tours for a couple of years. I missed a bunch of cuts in a row on like the Canadian tour one summer. And I remember thinking like, I'm like a bad person. Like this, it, it, it's crazy how easily your score can, can wrap up in the rest of everything you have going on. And no one was paying attention to any scores I was shooting. No. This was just for me. Yeah, everybody's So I can me. only imagine yeah. how that must have felt and how hard it must have been to separate like what's going on on the golf course from everything else in your life. Yeah, no, it was. It was very difficult. Um, I think Brooks Koepka probably said it best in the full swing doc, just talking about how he couldn't get away from the game when he went home. Yeah. And that was me for five years, couldn't get away from the game, just up night wait, uh, couldn't go to bed. I'd, I'd either be thinking about what I'm going to do the next day on the range to figure this out, or I'm thinking about just a nightmare shot that's like haunting me. It's like, I can't, I, I don't know what happens in the, yeah. like on this shot. And it was, for me, it was a big right miss. And uh, really, it's, it's like a quarterback, uh, you know, when they get their play sheet in and, and, or for instance, or even just like a baseball player, when they're when they're out on the mound and they can't figure out, they can't get command and they're just throwing it everywhere, they have to like be able to make an adjustment. And so many guys out here, they hit balls, not to hit balls and see what the golf ball looks like, but it's to figure out what the adjustment is. And I think any player that's played at an elite level knows you, it's just you out there and you have to be able to run through three or four things to correct a ball flight. And I, I had 30 things that I would try to do to correct the ball flight. And sometimes those 30 things would be in my head and I'd be running through all of them, not behind the ball, but over the ball. So I am just totally turned on over the golf ball. Um, and my biggest strength in golf when I was playing well was my creativity and feel. And when you're thinking constantly all day, you, you have no creativity and feel. And really by the, Every Thursday it felt like a Sunday, and I would be spent by the eighth hole, mentally, 
fatigued. Like I, I would get to 14 and be like mentally crawling because I just would be so worn out from, because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I mean, I'm sticking my hands in an ice bucket every night so I can go practice and hit balls. Because uh, I, I really truly believe that nobody practiced harder than I did for those probably three or four years. I mean, one of the reasons it seemed like such a good time to chat with you is because I feel like your story has a, a really positive turn in it. What happened next? Like, <laughs> yeah. you're doing pretty great right now. Yeah. At what point did you look into um, what could be a, a career in golf media or in broadcasting Man. or being on TV? It, it's never entered in my brain. You know, yeah. like this was never part of the plan. Uh, and even winning on the PGA Tour was never part of the plan. I would have loved to play on the PGA Tour. Uh, but I wasn't somebody that had that that belief in college. I just wanted maybe an opportunity to play an event. So for me, I feel like I over exceeded my expectations on the PGA Tour. Now, when I got out there, I was like, wait, I, I can I can do so much more. But uh, I'm very happy with my professional career. I mean, I, I saw the highs and the lows and, and so I might as well touch it all when we're out there. But uh, as far as the TV stuff goes, uh, it happened about a year and a half ago and I this is when I really started to open up more because for so long I was so secluded and, um, and being able to speak out uh, really just with people around me. So it started with my wife uh, telling her, it's like, hey, if I need to start doing something else, like I don't look at the bills. I'm not somebody that looks at the money. Like, do I need to do anything else? And she's, she's was like, you know, just, just keep doing whatever you want to do and I'll always support you. And um, I was just at the point where I'm like, is there something else? And my agent at the time, Jimmy Johnson, uh, I just called or texted him. I was like, hey, man, like, there's, if there's anything in, whether it's calling golf or anything in media, just, just throw a bone out there and see if anybody grabs it. Uh, and we, <laughs> it's funny, we'd, I worked with Massage Envy at the time, or maybe this was a year or two before that. And I was hosting this like show and they had all these other ambassadors like Tony Finau, Brant Snedeker, and they would come on my set and I would interview him. And I think he turned in and they, he turned in all that tape to, I think it was ESPN or something. And turns out they hired me from this Massage Envy ambassador set <laughs> from saying like, okay, your audition he's, tape. he's got a personality, yeah. whatever. And they're like, we'll give you a shot. And I thought that shot was going to be like a studio deal at, uh, you know, the PGA Tour Live thing here. And they're like, wait, we need somebody to walk at Southern Hills for the PGA Championship. Yeah. And I was like, hold straight on. Straight to a major. <laughs> I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, straight to a major? Like, am I going to seriously hold a mic at a, a major? I, like, how do you do it? What do you do? Like, and I, I remember asking uh, a couple of people about just advice. And I think it was either... Colt or somebody else that was like, yeah, man, it's a sink or swim deal. You either can do it or you can't. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, nothing to lose. So I'm just going to go out there and do my best. And uh, that first hole, my, in that 10th, or it was actually the 10th hole. Do you remember Southern Hills? Yeah, yeah it hole? goes kind of down and then down in right. a goalie. Yeah. Yep. And so it was terrible with uh, the static. So I'm, I can barely hear the guys that are back in the booth. And Will Zalatoris is, who ends up going in a playoff that week with JT, he's in the rough and he's got to hit over this smallish tree. The greens have been fairly firm all week. And they're like, what's Will Zalatoris got? And it's my first call, my first call. And I'm like, well, I tell you what, not a great line in the rough. I don't see how he can get this inside of 30 feet. And Willie Z gets up there and just goes whoosh, just like over the tree and it comes out like a butterfly. And it lands up like just over that little front bunker and rolls to like four or five feet. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a great start to my media career. I guess I, I, it's either you can or can't do it. And I guess I can't do it. And it got better as the week went on. And I, I really uh, started to really enjoy it. And um, I've told uh, several folks as well that that week in particular, uh, the really it felt like the lid and just kind of kind of came off a little bit. And the fact that I felt for the first time like nobody's looking over my shoulder and talking about me. I just felt I just felt comfortable in my own skin for the first time and I knew for whatever reason I was like I'm right where I should be. 
Oh, that's so cool. That's such a cool feeling. I remember <laughs> thinking like, man, Smiley seems like he's getting comfortable out there. You're eating a hot dog on yeah, camera at yeah. one point. It's a glizzy cam. That was, <laughs> that was a real highlight. Um, that's amazing that it happened so quickly. I mean, I guess Colt was right. He might not have been right about your first hole, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, can, you can either do it or you can. And I had so many people tell me quickly that I could do it. I was like, okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it seems like, I mean, obviously you have such good relationships with so many of the guys out there that, that know you know what it's all like and that you also just know them as people quite well. How has that been leaning on those guys? You know, it's been a good balance, right? You know, you want to respect your personal relationship with yeah. them, but also be a fair uh, critic as well um, and do your job, which is, you know, you're supposed to call it how you see it. And I felt like I've uh, been, that's been a, a fairly easy adjustment for me. I haven't um, felt like I've get, been in a situation where I was calling out a player for something that they would feel upset with me about. Yeah. And the, the strategy I've taken with that is I would want, if it were you calling my stuff or, or calling about my golf shots, I just never wanted somebody to ever question my work ethic or the fact that like, you know, th I know you're trying hard. And that, that's something that I always hated is when people question my work ethic or didn't really understand or, ha or be in the know about something, so just speculating. So I've tried to really, when I, do find something out. I, I like to, you know, get to the source, similar to stuff that you obviously do, but uh, and just keep those relationships. And and you know, I, I'm not one to, to to be a big gossiper when it comes to social media. I, I just I, I respect the guys too much. I, I like calling golf. I like to hear their stories. What you know, what's what what they're what bothers them, what their ups and downs are like. And you know, I always feel like I had a fun conversation anytime I get to speak with any of the players. Is a lot of the work that you then do week in and week out, you know, checking in with guys, finding out what they're working on, stuff like that, or, or what has been the biggest adjustment when it comes to just doing the job every week? <laughs> well, I just finished my year one, and I had, somebody had told me that the first year you're really going to understand what this job's all about. And I didn't believe him at the time because I'm like, you know what, I've already worked six events. I know what TV's all about. And it couldn't have been more right. I've learned so much this year on just really first off, just our, our business and, and being an on-course reporter and at times being an analyst, just the verbiage coming in and out as far as you know timing with, with certain things, when the right time to say something is. So you know that's, that's obviously been a learning curve, but um, sorry, what was the original question? I was- Yeah, yeah just, was, what does the work consist of, I guess? Like what? Obviously, it's something that you know so well that a lot of it is just like staying natural and getting comfortable. Yeah. But it, you know, how do you balance that with doing whatever prep work you have to do? Yeah, no, the prep is, and that's something kind of goes back to, you know, this first year. I've, I've learned, you know, different strategies on, on when to talk to players, whether it's observing them or, you know, just really when to stay away. <laughs> and I remember when I was playing, I always hated when I was warming up before a round and whether the TV people were right behind me or just, I always hated when like a ton of people were behind my bag when I'm trying to get ready for a round. Yeah. So I would try to avoid the range, but it's sometimes very difficult for us to, to get information that week about the player's game, unless you're really out there with them on a practice round, but you don't know who's gonna play well that week. So you can't be with everyone. You can't walk with everyone. That's yeah. been the biggest challenge is, is trying to figure out uh, what, the, what they're working on, you know, what the last month or two has been like, as far as just if they're trending or not, if, if they just found something that week. So that's been something that I've, I've kind of had to toy with how, what that strategy's like to not annoy people, <laughs> because you know, that's the last thing I want is for me to be walking up and, and people start turning away just because mm. I asked too much questions, I guess. Sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, you're smiley again. <laughs> there he is. There he comes. Think, I don't think you're there. Hey, What's your relationship with golf like now, playing? Yeah, uh, I, I have moments of brilliance. Yeah. And 
I, w I will say that I'm very comfortable on a golf course now. I, I still uh, feel that I hit shots at times that, and people that I play with are like, man, if you can do that, continue to do that, you should go back and play. And uh, that's just, I'm so far away from going back and playing on the PGA Tour, just I feel like I've kind of found my spot. You know, I, I really love media. I love being out here watching the guys play. Um, I also realize how miserable the guys look out here. I know they're making a lot of money, but it's a stressful job. Yeah. And the stress in my life has been kind of taken away a little bit. And now, anytime you speak on live TV, it, it, it is live. So there is some stress involved. Things can go wrong. With that. So <laughs> it, it, there is juice in TV, and I, I feel the adrenaline um, a lot. You know, there's plenty of days where I've had to learn strategies to, it, it feels like, you know, just as nerve wracking as when you are playing in these big moments, like what, how, you know, what the delivery is going to be like. And so I've, I've had to kind of find different ways to, to mentally be able to do this job in high pressure situations. So that's really fun um, to, because there's just as much juice in this job and, um, but golf for me, I, I hit a lot of great shots. I, I tell people that I most of the time will make somewhere between five to seven birdies around. Uh, some days I make five to seven bogeys. Some days I make zero bogeys. But for the most part, my birdies are kind of there. And, and then the, the bogeys are either there that day or they aren't. And we yeah. don't know if they're going to be there. <laughs> Looking back, is there anything that you, that you would change that you say, that you would say, you know, I wish I knew this earlier or I wish I had approached this differently? Or is it the sort of thing where, you know, it, it got you here, so therefore it was a good path? Yeah, no, I, I think maybe the only regret would be uh, I, I did have injuries, and I, I really did have some serious tendonitis going on yeah. that it didn't require surgery, but it was a chronic tendonitis, uh, really, in my wrist, um, and then my left elbow. So there was probably moments where I could have taken six months to nine months off to really get healthy, uh, and then really it would have helped me in that time period settle down and almost mm. just press the brakes and be able to go and almost have like a golf retreat with my team to get everybody back on the same page and get me confident again. So that, for me, I think, I think it got a little bit too fast, me trying to f fix things, because I'd, I feel like I'm a problem solver. And mm -hmm. when you were so good at pro <laughs> problem solving for a couple of years and, and you always had the answers, and then all of a sudden you don't have the answers, and then you're leaning on people a little bit too much, and you're not, not taking uh, full ownership in your game, you know, that for me was something I wish I could go back and probably just kind of take a little time off. And just the last thing, was there a moment when you felt like, all right, I really made the right call. I'm, I'm right where I deserve to be. Is it, you mentioned at Tulsa, was it really that, that soon that you knew? Yeah, I would say two moments, you know, I, I would say in Tulsa, just, I feel like my anxiety was lifted, just I felt like my personality woke up again. So that, that was a great place, obviously, the starting point. But I'll even go back to uh, the end of this year at the Ryder Cup. And I am not an emotional person. Like, I'm not a crier. Uh, I'm not somebody even, like, even if, like, it's a, a sad movie, like, I can't even tear up. And the first hole of the Ryder Cup this year, walking off the tee, the first, I think I was with the second group, and that scene at the Ryder Cup, I'm walking down the first fairway and my wife was up there. Uh, she came for the week and uh, it was just so cool to see her and then just walk up the fairway. And I, I was literally tearing up and emotional. I was like, this is exactly where I should be. And so that for me was like, OK, I'm, I'm you know, you are where your feet are. And I was very happy with where my feet were. You are where your feet are. I right, better stop before I start tearing up here. Uh, Smiley, thanks so much. Sounds like you've got a, a good schedule ahead. We'll see you at the Hero. We'll see you at Century. You got yes. some good island travel coming up. Yeah, and Sony too, so. And Sony too. Yeah, right. mixed with some little bit of uh, holiday cheer in the middle of that, but yeah, excited to uh, get back to work. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. My man, anytime.